Welcome to the News Review segment. As we dig into the papers, we're joined by media consultant Liz Hafen Asari. She is our guest. Madam Hafen Asari, a very good morning to you. It's Tuesday again. Here we are. Hope good you're well. Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. It's a pleasure. Hope you're well. I'm fine. A little tired because I did a little traveling over the weekend, but I, I'll get over it. Ah. Uh, well, yeah, it, it, it'll come eventually. As for the tiredness, um, we're, we're all in it. We all face it every day. But here we are doing what <laughs> we do best. Let's quickly get into the Daily Graphic uh, newspaper. And I'll be running by you some of the latest we heard from the president in his 28th COVID-19 address. Uh, the Daily Graphic says, Life picking up at borders, Aplao Elubo Paga traders, excited uh, different parts of the country and uh, life is gradually picking up at the country's land borders following their reopening yesterday. Now, in anticipation of the frontiers becoming buoyant, the Ghana Immigration Service has deployed its personnel to the borders. At the Aflao border in particular, where we were told about 400 officers have uh, been deployed, uh, business activities were at a slow pace. So that is the latest. The land borders have been reopened. At least uh, what is your reaction to, to this? It's been about two years, and some of them say their businesses have virtually, or better still, literally collapsed. What does it mean to you now that we are reopening our land borders? I think it's a good sign. Like you said, two years is a very long time to have your land borders closed, especially when you look at the ECOWAS protocols, and it talks about free movement of peoples across our borders. And then we closed ours for two years, knowing that a lot of our traders use the borders. I mean, Burkina Faso, we go to Nigeria to bring in staff, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, and there's a lot of brisk trading on the borders. So when you close the borders, then it means that the people who live in that area who are engaged in trade or some, or one or another kind of business, have no business and are sitting and just waiting for two years is a long time. We can send you from no matter how much you had in your account to zero because then you're doing absolutely nothing. Um, again, when our borders were closed for that long, did we think about the people on the borders? What other creative business could they have entered? Um, who is supposed to take care of that? If you're talking about industry, are we trading amongst ourselves as a people? So two years having the borders closed is a very long time. And I, I, I feel sorry for those who live on the borders because I, I shudder to think what they have been through. Do you think uh, for a period this was self-inflicted? Other countries have uh, relaxed their measures. I mean, it, it's been a while since some countries relaxed their measures and you know, activated or reactivated their borders and all of that. Have we kept too long, do you think? Um, it will, it, I, I, won't, I don't know. I think that we have kept too long. Yes, two years is a very long time. I think that we should have put in measures to mitigate um, whatever problems would suffer at the borders. We should have been very proactive and found ways of ensuring that those who were coming in were tested at the borders. I mean, if, if you want to make sure that you, your country is safe from COVID, what measures are you putting in? We should have put in measures so that people who were using the borders could also have been tested or vaccinated or made sure that whoever was coming in was COVID free. We could have done all kinds of things rather than close our borders for two years. I believe two years was too long. Mm. Well, anyway, that is it uh, for the land of borders. And at least the traders are excited. Better late than never. Uh, we say. <laughs> in other stories in the Daily Graphic, bid for Apiate redesign begins, that story on page 16, but one that I believe will intrigue you on page 34, GJA Press Center to be redeveloped, MOU uh, signed, and the Ghana Journalists Association, the National Media Commission, and the Right to Information Commission have committed to redevelop the International Press uh, center in an ultra-modern office to accommodate all media-related entities and umbrella bodies in the country. The commitment was made during the signing of a memorandum of understanding at the premises of the Ministry of Information yesterday. How does this strike you? How excited are you by 
uh, such a development. It's been said that what we have now is not exactly fit for purpose. Let me just leave it at that. Excited? No. You're not? No. Why not? <laughs> Why not? I'm not excited. I'm not excited about GJ because I felt that GJ would have gone bigger than it is today. Um, GJ kind of slowed in its movement of things. Um, GJ could have been more proactive. As for the development to house other um, entities that work with GJ, yes, I mean, it's long overdue. But I, I was of the view that GJ was going to develop the press center beyond just the conference rooms. We were supposed to have hostels or a hotel for journalists who were coming in to cover assignments. We were supposed to have all kinds of things. You should have been ultra modern before now. So it's not exciting for me. I think that we have just been too slow in getting our act together. Mm. Well, that's an interesting uh, perspective. And, and when you say you expect the GGA to have grown beyond what it has become now, how exactly would you have, have expected it to, to, to have grown? In which specific aspects, briefly? If you, if you look at the media lands, landscape today, right. um, when we went into media pluralism, we had a lot of stations that were open and, and we realized that the people who were put in, in behind the mic did not have that requisite training. It should have been easy for GJ to say, okay, we have courses for members of GJ. We have courses for journalists on a whole. So we would work with the media institutions, make sure that everybody's properly trained and that we are delivering as our mandate as journalists um, will allow us to. We did not do that. We just left it, and even though we have the institutions, not everybody is going into the institutions. Not everybody can afford to go into the institutions, but you have a lot of people who are working on the job. So how do you get the people who are working on the job and learning from their job up to scratch? How do you match them with those who are coming out of school? How do you ensure that we are being very professional in the work that we're doing, not only as journalists, not only as journalists on the job, but making sure that we go out and do what we have to do and do it properly. I think that GJ had a very big role to play, just as I think that the NMC also had a role to play. But some refresher courses were had in the past. I haven't heard about many lately. I don't know how journalists upgrade their skills when they start working and all like that. And I thought that GJ would be in the forefront of pushing and ensuring that we had proper people on the ground who were working. Mm. So have they failed in that regard? The GJ, the NMC and others, have they failed in that respect? To a large extent, because we end up having a lot of sensationalism. Mm. And if you look at the media landscape, now the, the, the our targets or the population is moved by what certain media houses say. And if, if they're saying it's just because they want to say it or because they're being sensational or because they want to be seen to be in the media space, what good has it done us? Mm. Interesting perspectives there. Let, let's go on the international front and come back to Ghana briefly. Uh, this story on page five uh, says, Zimbabwean opposition wins majority seats in by-elections. You know why I'm reading this, right? Zimbabwean opposition wins majority seats in by-elections. If our story is anything to go by, hmm, then this is going to be another interesting twist in their legislative uh, body. But the final bit I'll do from the uh, Daily Graphic, single spine policy review in offing, and it's to undergo a, a, a review, surgical or otherwise, to address salary inequalities, weak salary administration, and management of conditions of service 14 years after its implementation. Um, th th this has come to the fore. This is one of the problems that we have had. We have policies for so long, they are never reviewed, or at least the review is never really um, efficient or surgical enough. And we wait till there are many glaring problems. What are your problems, Liz, with uh, the single spine salary structure, as, as you've seen it and as you've known it? You don't get... Uh 
um, kind of employees that you want. I mean, those who are very good would not take single spine. I mean, because they'll earn more in the private sector than they earn in the public sector. The single spine was kind of like to rectify that so you have very good people in the public sector and in the, in the pub, in, and in the private sector and earning about the same. Unfortunately, it did not work out like that. So you struggle to employ people in the public sector because they come in, they get, they, they would use it as a stepping stone um, to gain some experience and then go into private practice where they will earn more. So it should have been done long ago. We should have reviewed the policy long ago. So we get people who are competent in the public sector, who would stay in the public sector and work, knowing that the remuneration they will get at the end could compare to anybody in the private sector. And if you don't do that, then our private, our public institutions will always be lacking. You'd always have to get people on contract and pay them more because those that you have employed right. probably are not up to scratch when it comes to doing certain jobs. So we need to make sure that the public sector is up and running. And if you can't employ qualified people, competent people, then you have a problem. You do have a problem. Uh, that also means that the localized brain drain will continue as far as the public and private sectors are concerned. And you're, you're completely right. Exactly. The private sector will continue because of its uh, uh, economic pull to get the best of them. And the rest would end up in the public sector, maybe to nobody's benefit, not to the benefit of society. Uh, nose mask patronage drops drastically as public response to ease of COVID-19 protocols. We've moved to the Ghanaian Times uh, newspaper now. And uh, this is something that we've, we've also been exploring uh, right here at the Multimedia Group. Nose mask patronage uh, dropping drastically. In fact, it's interesting because we hear some of these people even went for loans in recent times uh, to order face masks and all of that because it's been a long, you know, protracted process where we've all been wearing masks and preventing COVID-19. And then boom, we don't even have to wear or don masks anymore. At least it's not mandatory. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use them at all. Use them for your own safety, in fact. I, I feel, honestly, Liz, that when Mr. President delivered his address, I feel that portion could have been left out. This is just me. I'm not a member of the president's communications team. But I felt we could have left out the bit about it's no longer mandatory because I feel it just creates the picture where people are going to be, if we were at five out of 100, is now going to go perhaps into negative territory. I feel we could have just left that so that people don't consciously feel, oh, let's, let's get rid of it. Those who will don it will don it anyway. I don't, I don't know what you think, but uh, it's going to affect sales on the market. And from what we hear, a lot of people are not going to be, you know, uh, have anything, any feeling geared towards using it, unless we maybe have another surge of COVID-19. But I thought that people had stopped using face masks long ago. I mean, in certain places, you'd be, it was mandatory for you to put on a mask before you enter certain shops or certain offices. Mm. But seriously, if you step out of Accra, you realize that people were not using their face even as far back as 2021. Mm. Um, a few finals in, in Cape Coast, Elmina, Takradi, and you come from a crying, you don your mask, and you're like an alien, and everybody tends to look at you. They know you're from out of town because they were not bothered about using it the way we did in Accra. Um, as for announcing that it shouldn't be used, I mean, it's neither here nor there. Like you said, those who want to wear it will still wear it. Um, it's not mandatory. As for those who are going to lose money as a result, um, I believe that when, when you go into business, there are certain risks that you take. So you really have to um, mitigate. What will they do? I don't know what they will do. But um, I, 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 I'm sorry for them, but unfortunately, that is where we have gotten to now. As to whether it should have been announced, I think that it should have been announced and it has been announced so that a lot of people would be liberal when people are entering their offices or entering certain places without masks. 
But let us not forget that there is a caveat. You must be fully vaccinated. Right. So if you're not vaccinated, then you have to be wearing a mask, even though it has been said that it's not mandatory. If you are not fully vaccinated, then you don't go causing problems for those who have been fully vaccinated. Mm. So we need to take our lives into our own hands. We need to ensure that if you're if you're going into a certain space, what are you going to do to ensure that people who are coming in and those who are vaccinated, are we going to be inspecting cards or things like that? So that if you don't have a card, you don't enter a certain space. So you are not at, you are not posing um, a risk to those who have been vaccinated and those who are who are, are keeping to the law and abiding by the law. So we need to make sure that even though it has been said that it's not mandatory, we are supposed to be vaccinated. So everybody should get vaccinated. So we are all safe. Well, that uh, ties into the story on page 18. In fact, is the banner headline uh, for the Ghanaian Times newspaper. COVID-19 update. Unvaccinated persons pose danger to society. That's according to the GMA. So just succinctly, the GMA has welcomed the ease of restrictions as announced by the government on Sunday, cautioning, however, that unvaccinated persons still posed a risk. And, and that is, uh, I mean, just the first paragraph basically uh, puts everything into proper perspective. And, and we know we still have millions of people uh, who have not been vaccinated. Mr. President, in the address, also mentioned that hopefully by June, we would, um, by June, dear, uh, we would have vaccinated uh, the 20 plus million that we're expecting. So hopefully we get there. But in the interim, when we've not achieved what some scientists dispute, herd immunity, some are for it, some say this thing doesn't even exist. Uh, I guess we would have to Still be careful as we go into these mass gatherings, whether they are rallies or at entertainment, you know, uh, venues or whatever, to ensure that we are protecting ourselves. But uh, this final one from the yeah, Ghanaian Times. Need, mm, we, go, go ahead. We need to be very careful, especially because some people who are being vaccinated have still gotten COVID after they have been vaccinated. So um, we just shouldn't take it at face value and think that everything is fine. Like the GM is saying that unvaccinated people pose a threat to even those who have been vaccinated. So we all need to be very careful. We need to stay safe. Uh, RTI finds Kolebu Teaching Hospital 30,000 Ghana cities for failure to give information upon request. Why this excites me, um, a lot of our public institutions, when you want information, they say right to information. Uh, law and all of that. But trust me, it's easier said than done. Easier uh, said than followed through when it comes to the processes involved. We've heard from the information minister who says, let's see more. But when you push, there's a pushback. And we've seen it here at the multimedia group. And others have seen it too that we know of. So, and it comes with all of these charges as well. Some of them uh, simply outrageous. What's your take on that? And now that some of them are getting fines and all of that, will this make uh, getting information easier, do you think? It should. It should make that uh, information easier. Um, um, you realize that in the past, the public institutions have held on to information as if the information belongs to them. We want them to understand that information belongs to the people and not to the institutions. The information you have is created with taxpayers' money. The taxpayers need to know what is happening with their money. So we need to be as transparent as possible in all our public institutions. Except for the exempt laws, I think that information, if the, if the institutions want to be um, open and proactive, the information that they have, they should just put it out there. And if you, if you put the information out there, it becomes very easy. But everybody thinks that they have one uh, thing to hold on, and that is information. But if you're keeping the information, how do the public know how the institution is running, how the institution is doing? Um, if you need the information to make yourself a better person, to make informed choices, and the information is being held from you, how do you contribute meaningfully to the development of the of the nation if you don't have the information that you need that will help you make those informed choices. 
Again, for those in academia who do all kinds of surveys and all kinds of research, information should be made available to them. You go to do your thesis and you go to a public institution and you're frustrated because nobody wants to give the information, but the information does not belong to them. Mm. And they should begin to understand that. They should begin to understand that they need to be open and transparent. And that is what everybody is pushing for. They need to be accountable to the people who are paying for the information they are generating. Right. The story caught my attention just to wrap. ECG Transformer at Dunyo are stolen and thieves have vandalized and stolen parts of a newly installed transformer of the electricity company of Ghana that serves residents of Dunyo, a suburb of uh, Ghana West municipality of the Greater Accra region. Uh, just this morning, I caught wind of a story where someone was robbed uh, yesterday. And it, it appears nowadays uh, things are just getting out of hand. I know these things have always happened, but how rampant they are. It appears, I don't know whether it's on the back of um, <clears throat> the economic times or whatever, but people are becoming more and more bold and, and doing things that ordinarily you wouldn't hear of. Just in a bit, I don't know whether to keep body and soul together. I really do not know. It's, it's, it's uh, frightening <clears throat> at the rate that robbery is happening and now even in broad daylight and it's 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 even more frightening when it is an armed robbery when people are shooting people in broad daylight and others can, uh, are helpless can't do anything about it and i think that much as the police has have up their game they still have a lot to do right and um, i don't know who who is taking uh, cognizance of the, the the number of arms that we have in this country and how come everybody seems to be having arms and moving around. But again, we should be each other's keeper and we need to rally together. In, in the past, you had some vigilante groups. Unfortunately, some vigilante groups were um, traumatized by police shooting some of their members and things like that. You don't hear right. about those groups anymore because um, you it, it, it became mixed up. Politics and everything mixed it up. So those who were protecting their territory as in like having a group to patrol their residential areas don't have that anymore. Right. Um, so the police need to be patrolling. The police need to be up and doing. We need to have and see a police presence Right. And if possible, I, I keep saying that we have we have become a people who no longer fear the police. We are not supposed to fear the police. We are supposed to work with them. Right. They are law enforcement. They are supposed to be protecting us. But over the years, we've seen them with the military do some patrol um, and duties. And that staved and scared people from taking the law into their own hands and robbing and doing all kinds of things. But I think that Again, the economic situation is what is upping what we are seeing. And right. Unemployment frustrates people, and if they need money to live and they think that they can get out of illegal means, right. they resort to all kinds of things. So we also need to be working on ensuring that the youth is employed and properly employed, that they're earning something for themselves. Right. Some of them have struggled by themselves and have gotten to a stage where now frustration sets in because they have pushed and done all the education they can do. They have all the degrees they have, they right. can have, and yet they're still by themselves and they're not earning anything. It pushes the youth to do all kinds of things. So right. we as a people need to make sure that unemployment is brought to the barest minimum. People can earn a decent living. And maybe when we do that, we'll see less of the robberies that we're seeing today. Let's wrap with a few more stories. Uh, the Daily Guide newspaper, businessman defends um, Reku Duka. There's also, I didn't win 2020 election. That's according to former President Mahama, at least as couched by the story. It's on page three. There's also Nana Opens Tamale Interchange uh, today. Exciting uh, news for that interchange. When you open into page three, X mass log boss still missing. And that's where I'd like to pick your thoughts, Liz. <clears throat> now, the whereabouts of 
former chief executive officer of microfinance and small loan center, uh, that is Maslock, Sedina Ationu uh, Tamaklu, who is standing trial for causing over 93 million Ghana cities worth of financial loss to the state, remains unknown as the prosecution takes steps to hold her sureties accountable. The Office of the Attorney General has filed an application for extraction of the sureties who executed the accused person's bail bond when she first appeared before the court. The extraction of the bond on the sureties would mean that they will have to make available the 5 million Ghana cities or the properties used as justification for the execution of the bail uh, bond. And um, that's, that's uh, to put it uh, you know, succinctly, the thrust of the story. I, I, it, it, as far as the story is concerned, I would just want it to come to some logical conclusion. Uh, we often talk about people stealing uh, petty things. Uh, recently, I think someone stole uh, several uh, is it, uh, bunches of plantain or something and was given a hefty sentence. And, and you can't blame the judges. It has to do with our penal code. But uh, for people who are accused of causing financial loss to the state, uh, you would want some conclusivity on matters and and if if they deserve to uh, be reprimanded so be it but in this instance it appears the long arms of the law simply cannot reach sedina uh, tamaklu what's your take on this briefly <laughs> the long arms of the law have ensured that she has sureties so if the sureties can't get her to to appear in court then they they have to take it um um, full square because they put themselves out and trusted that they would make sure that she was in court anytime she was called. Mm. So if she's not there and 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 they have they've they've they stood um, surety for her, definitely if they have to pay or if whatever they have to do, I think that the long arm of the law knows exactly what it has to do, mm. and so it sh it should go ahead. Um, I don't think that she's lost. I believe that she probably has some problems and is probably out of the country. But again, I think that we should be able to work well together as a people, not think that because she belongs to another party and she was in that position, something untoward has been done. She is she's, um, she's, um, deemed to be innocent and to proven guilty. Indeed, that so is our that law. But, but with such people, I, I don't know... Um, I mean, there's always the flight risk or travel risk with such people, which is why sometimes their passports are confiscated or whatever the case may be. If someone has caused financial loss to the state, to a huge, uh, to the tune of, you know, millions of CDs, I mean, what actions were taken? Was her passport still available to her and all of that? I mean, <coughs> could we have prevented this? That, that's the whole point. Um, well, I think she traveled out um, um, for medical attention. I believe, if I if I read if I remember what I read properly, right. um, so so probably that she was given that leniency, and everybody believed that she would abide by what whatever uh, agreement was they came to. But if she's not back, I don't have the details as to what has happened to right. her. But definitely. Like you're saying, anybody who has been found to cause financial loss must be made to face the rigors of the law. That is is without without um, um, any question. I mean, everybody who takes our money and misuses our money has to face the the consequences. Right. So definitely, the courts need to carry out whatever they have to carry out, and if. She's tried in absentia or whatever they choose to do. If she's found guilty, I believe she still has assets in this nation. I believe she still has a bank account and things like that. I'm sure the law knows what it has to do. I'm sure the attorney general has an idea of exactly what the, what the outcome will be if she's found guilty. Uh, the final newspaper this morning says, Cocobot warns of possible fertilizer shortage over Russia-Ukraine war. And we know why, because uh, Russia, with its mass deposits of, uh, you know, petroleum products, also one of the derivatives is uh, phosphate and all of that. They are the major, I think, the second biggest producer in the world behind uh, Canada. So that is going to affect us. But again, uh, as I always say, Nigeria, Dangote has just opened one of those uh, fertilizer production plants. In Ghana, I guess 
everything must be a problem. There must arise a problem. Uh, it said that problems bring solutions. But for us, we know the problems exist, but it, it must come to a head before we decide, oh, we must do something. We don't have these plants here, and likely we're going to have to now go to Nigeria. Not to say it's wrong. I mean, it, it's all part of the after bit. It's all part of the the economic integration. But if we can do for ourselves, we shouldn't, you know, uh, leave it for someone to do uh, for us. There's also... Necessity uh, is the mother of invention. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also 4.1 million metric ton increase projected from production of 11 major crops in 2022, but access to and rising cost of inputs a threat. That's according to the Agric uh, Minister. And uh, there's also Nigeria versus Ghana preview. Black stars need pate kudus, others to turn up. Afenajan as well. Uh, what would be your expectation and maybe your prediction ahead of uh, today's clash in Abuja? Black stars of Ghana, Super Eagles of Nigeria, as we wrap. I'm not a football fanatic, but once Black Stars is playing, I'm supporting Black Stars. Do you have a scoreline in mind? <laughs> <laughs> None whatsoever. I got you there. I don't even know who the players are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just, heard, I've just heard recently about party and everybody talking about party, but who he is, what he does on the field, I, I have no idea. I know Jordan and you and the day I you. And that's, that's about all I know about soccer. Well, I'll tell you this. Thomas Partey plays for Arsenal in the English Premiership. And uh, he's a midfielder. He's one of our midfielders. Uh, he's the vice captain as well. So just a few details about Thomas. Uh, Who's Partey. the captain? Uh, the captain is Andre Dede Ayu. Okay. Mm. I so, wish them well. Thank you. Well, thank you on their behalf. That's, that's great to hear. Liz, thank you for joining us uh, this morning as we've dug thank you into... Thank Sure. And uh, a very colorful dress, though. I forgot to mention that. Very colorful thank outfit. Thank you. Yeah. I love um, it. I love it. I, I do, I, right now, I do only made in Ghana stuff. I see. That's... So this is GTP. Interesting. Kudos to you. Keep it up. Thank you. Okay, so that has been uh, our interaction with media consultant Liz Hafen Asari as we've dug into the papers. Today, just as we did the other day on uh, the 25th, we, it's, it's match day, match day two, if you like. So on the last leg of the show, we'll bring you sports there as we uh, get into the major matters and even cross over to uh, Nigeria. But coming up uh, next after this, we'll be digging into our big, big, big uh, stories. We're talking about the, the reopening of our land borders, and we're talking about the likely increase in transport fares, among a pot of other issues. All of that up next on the AM Show. Stay.